So I'm Paul Kendrick, and my project was a 3D hydrodynamic simulation of classical nova explosions. So I'll start off with an introduction and my simulation model and technical challenges. I'll go into co-development history and results. I'll talk about uh, computational performance, and I'll finish off with conclusions and future work. So ANOVA is a binary system between a star and a white dwarf. So you can see the star over here and the white dwarf over here. The white dwarf is approximately the size of the Earth, and it can pull uh, gas off of the star over here, and it accretes onto the surface of the white dwarf, forming an accretion disk. And over time, the density of the, part of, uh, of the hydrogen gas on the white dwarf surface will increase, and as it reaches critical conditions, it will undergo thermonuclear runaway and explode the gas on its shell. Can you give us some scale? How far apart are these centers? Uh, so this is, um, the, for the NOVA I'm modeling, it's about 6.5 solar radiuses, and so that's about uh, six and a half times the total size of our sun. And I mean, it varies, there's many different types of NOVA. Um, a different type of NOVA is a, one where the companion star is a red giant, and the white dwarf is very far away, and um, uh, I think a couple of AU away astronomical units. And so there's very different systems. However, the uh, binary system that I'm focusing on is a very close recurrent uh, binary system. And so simulating nova are important because they can lead to a type 1a supernova. So the white dwarf can eventually build up mass over time and then implode, uh, approach the Chandrasekhar limit and go as a type 1a supernova. And those can be used to measure distances in our universe as a standard candle. However, nova themselves can also be used as a standard candle. However, they are not as bright as a supernova. Uh, nova are also important to understand for stellar evolution and for understanding unusual light curves. So there are some technical challenges with doing this project. And the main one is that there's a large difference between the density of hydrogen gas on the star and on the white dwarf surface. And so this means that there's a large particle count required on the white dwarf surface in order to reach explosion conditions. And so this is around one million uh, on the white dwarf surface itself. And so the particle density on the star will always decrease no matter how many particles are run in the simulation. And this is because the white dwarf will pull the particles off of the star and the particle density will decrease. And so many professional simulations do not simulate the accretion phase. And so the goal of this project was to simulate the full life cycle of ANOVA. So I was really wanting to simulate the accretion phase. The first known simulation of accretion was done by Walder, Filoni, and Short back in 2008. And however, it is only for a limited amount of time. And so I developed, uh, to overcome these challenges, I developed a new particle recycling and blocking method to simulate accretion and the full life cycle of ANOVA. And so another technical challenge is that there's a large difference in time scale. So the accretion phase takes years, whereas the explosion phase takes hours to days. So from the above mentioned technical challenges, this problem becomes very calculation intensive uh, with the amount of time scale it takes for the accretion phase. So I overcame this by using parallelization such as MPI and OpenCL. Are you saying these professional simulations they know they don't simulate accretion? Uh, so what the professional simulations do is they take the accretion rate as an input parameter. And so they say that if the accretion rate is uh, this number, then they uh, find the amount of mass accumulated onto the surface of the they white dwarf by that. No, they don't. So this is my simulation model here. So since it is unrealistic to model individual atoms of hydrogen gas, each particle here represents a volume of hydrogen gas. And so I'm focused on simulating just a uh, shell of the star, so I'm not simulating the full entire star. And so the core here is being modeled by using a repulsive force to keep the, star, or keep the particles in this outside edge of the star here. So each particle will compute, or e the gravitational force gets computed for each particle to the core and to the white dwarf over here. And so uh, since it is a binary system, I'm using a rotating frame about the center of mass here. And uh, the centrifugal forces pull the particles outwards on the shell over here. And the Coriolis force causes this bending effect to spiral in uh, for the accretion disk. So these are the uh, equations used to compute the forces on the particles. So this is basically what I just talked about. So the, force, the total force acting upon the particles is the force due to gravity, the centrifugal force, the Coriolis force, and I also include a friction and Langevin force. And this is uh, the Langevin force gives particles a random kick, uh, velocity kick to kind of spread out the shell and to form a stable shell. So this is modeling back pressure from the core itself. And the friction is used to model viscosity of the gas. Uh, I'm not including particle-particle uh, interactions or collisions in this model. 
So I'm using the velocity value method to solve Newton's laws of motion. And so this is, can be seen up here. And so initially, the acceleration gets computed. And then inside a loop here, the uh, x positions, or the positions of the particles are updated using half of the old acceleration. The velocities are updated using half of the old acceleration. And then the new accelerations are computed, and the velocity is updated with half of the new accelerations. So I looked into other uh, in uh, other methods such as the predictor corrector. However, this requires two uh, acceleration updates, which requires basically twice the amount of time to compute this. So I chose the velocity value method because it was twice as fast. Particle-particle uh, -particle interactions are ignored throughout the simulation. And so this is because the large scale of the system, the particles, don't really have much of an effect uh, due to gravity on each other. So as I mentioned earlier, the star and the white dwarf core both have repulsive forces. And so I use the one then weight function, which can be seen over here. So this is a nice function that falls off to zero. And so uh, also the friction and Langevin forces are used to stabilize the gas shell. And the white dwarf gravitational force is slowly turned on over the course of several days in order to avoid a shock to the simulation. So I started off making just a two-particle binary system uh, at the very beginning of this project. So that was just the star and the white dwarf orbiting each other. And then I went to moving a stable uh, or a shell of particles around the sun or the star in order to model the shell. And so I'm using, I started off using an exponential wall for that function. However, I later changed that. Uh, I added the white dwarf to the model. And after this, I soon realized that I would need to parallelize the, the program because it was running really slow. So I went to MPI, which is message patching interface. And I'll talk about this more later on. I also, uh, soon after that, I created OpenCL version to uh, additionally speed up the program much more. And then I changed the wall functions to a woodland weight because the exponential function did not fall off to zero. And I wanted the, the force of particles field to go to zero. So I used the woodland weight. And it was also faster to evaluate on the graphics card. So I added friction, Langevin, the Coriolis, uh, and centrifugal forces to the model, which is basically adding the rotating frame on uh, that aspect. And so uh, I was running the simulation at this point, And I realized that I could never achieve a nova explosion. And so I developed the particle recycling method and the blocking method in order to do this. And I'll talk about this in more detail later on. And throughout the course of the project, I've been developing a post-processing program to read in the data files and export them for viewing in pair view. So I use Mercurial and Bitbucket for revision. And I don't expect you to read this, but each line here represents a, a code change over time. So this is just a screenshot of Bitbucket. So this is a kernel flow chart. So this kind of represents what's going on during the simulation at each time step. And so the host code will call the kernel uh, throughout each time step. And the kernel is being executed on the, on the graphics card. And so the graphics card can have hundreds or even thousands of cores. And so this kernel is being executed on all the cores of the graphics card simultaneously. And so each kernel will essentially update the forces that one particle feels uh, per call. And so uh, the kernel will read in the variables from global memory into local memory, which is a much faster memory space to handle the calculations. Uh, it'll then loop over the number of blocks, which is basically if you have a million particles, you can't fit that on the graphics card. So you have to group those into small blocks. And then the uh, first update of velocity delay gets performed. And then the accelerations and all the forces being acted upon the particle are computed. And then the second half of the velocity delay is updated. And the variables are written back out to global memory so that the CPU can pull the data off of the graphics card. And so um, the host code will also perform the particle recycling and blocking methods. And so uh, I'll talk in, about those more in detail. And so the host code will also write all the data to the file that the post-processing program can later read in. And so for this project, I primarily used the two NVIDIA GTX 580s. However, also compared to the 7970 uh, AMDs to compare my simulation against uh, the different architecture. So this is the particle recycling method. And this is what allowed me to do Nova explosions because of the large amount of particles required. And so the particles are initialized around the star, as you can see here. And they get pulled over by the white dwarf. And when they get near the white dwarf, they basically stick onto the surface. And so that can be seen here by the green particles around the white dwarf. And so the program will keep track of the particles that are stuck onto the white dwarf. And if this count is greater than 1,000, uh, one particle mass will get scaled by 1,000. And the other 999 will be reinitialized around the star over here. So this is essentially a way of reusing the particles in order to maintain a stable density, particle density on the star. And the effective white dwarf mass 
uh, the effective particle mass on the white dwarf surface remains the same. And so with the particle recycling method, only about 500 particles are needed to reach nova explosions. And so the conditions for that is the density of the gas on the surface of the white dwarf has to be one kilogram per cubic centimeter, and the temperature has to be 20 million Kelvin, and it will undergo the thermonuclear runaway. So without the particle recycling method, about 500,000 particles are needed on the surface of the white dwarf. And of course, the particle density on the star will always decrease as well. So the part particle recycling method allowed me to overcome these challenges here. So the blocking method also allowed me to maintain a stable density on the star. And so there's an initial activated block here by the program. And so there's a limit of how many particles at a minimum must be on the star shell. And so if the, since the white dwarf is pulling particles off and it's forming the accretion disk, particles are being lost on the star shell. And so we have the reserve activated or unactivated particle block here. And if that uh, count of the star goes below that threshold, small blocks are, act are activated and essentially added to the star in order to form a stable uh, star count throughout the simulation. So as you can see here, I'm comparing without particle recycling to with particle recycling. And so uh, green part uh, this green curve here represents the uh, particle count on the star itself. And so you can see that without particle recycling, the star count drops very quickly. And the particle, the, there's so many particles on the star after a certain time. And so that basically halts the simulation because the white dwarf uh, reaches a stable point and cannot pull off more particles. So the accretion rate drops. Uh, whereas with particle recycling, the particle count on the star remains constant, and I'm able to achieve nova explosions, which are these spikes down here. The amount of particles stuck on the white dwarf is much smaller. However, that represents a larger volume of particles because of the mass scaling. So this shows the accretion rate versus time. So the accretion rate is a measure of mass collected on the surface per year. And so here, without particle recycling, the accretion spikes. And this is due to the uh, white dwarf pulling off all the particles on the star shell. However, it runs out of particles, so the accretion rate drops over time. Whereas with the particle recycling, the uh, accretion rate continues to increase and then reaches a stable plateau here. And the spikes can be seen as nova explosions. So this shows that my model, with their particle recycling and blocking method, can achieve multiple nova explosions throughout the course of one simulation rather than the accretion rate falling off and becoming unstable and never reaching an explosion. So for this project, I primarily focused on modeling the Nova U Scorpi. And so this is, has about a 10 hour or 10 year explosion period on average. And so it's very famous for its very fast explosion period. And so I'm primarily focused on modeling the 2010 outburst. So these are the uh, outbursts previously in time. And so the white dwarf has about 1.3 solar masses, so it's a little bit bigger than our sun. And the, the companion star is a little bit smaller than our sun at 0.88 solar masses. And their orbital period is about 1.26 days between the two. And they have about a 6.5 solar radius separation distance between the two. So this is my simulation before explosion. So this is with one million particles. And so the blue particles here, this can be seen as the star shell. And then the particle transfer stream is moving towards the white dwarf, which you can see is this red region here. And so the particles are being pulled over to the white dwarf. And this is about, uh, about 10 years of simulation time right before the explosion. So this is 100 seconds after the explosion. So the exploded gas shell is expanding very rapidly throughout the system. And it's going to start hitting all this material out here. So 14 minutes after the explosion, it's still very rapidly expanding. And it's starting to hit the star here. And it's moved through all the accretion disk, or moved through all the particles. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, each particle in the exploded shell has an average velocity of about 500, uh, 500, or 5,000 kilometers per second. So it's expanding very rapidly. And after 22 minutes, it's basically moved through the whole entire star. And so the star, it caused this flat edge to form here in the, uh, on the exploding shell, and a reflective wave uh, to form also back here. And this is due to the particles hitting the star. And so that's why the uh, hole is basically punctured by the star. So I have some movies in my simulation to show you. Of course you do. <laughs> we better turn off the lights. Okay. Uh, uh, like that's that better? Yeah. Okay. So this is a movie here. So the particles are colored by uh, velocity. So this is zoomed in. So this, is, this white ball here is the white dwarf. And so particles are being pulled in, and they're being circled, or 
kind of wrapped around the white dwarf and collecting onto the surface. And so this is the Coriolis, force, or the Coriolis effect here, and this is due to the uh, fast rotation of the system. So the particles are moving in and they're being uh, swirled around the white dwarf. So this is here is a movie of the explosion. And so the expanding shell is moving throughout the system very rapidly here. And right here, you can see a flat edge start to form and the reflected edge moving out here. So you can see the, the hole formed by the star and it's expanding uh, rap very rapidly. And so this is what gives the, the, very, the light curves, which I'll talk about later on. And so it just basically continues to expand. And I'll play this again here. So you can see the exploded shells moving throughout the system uh, very rapidly. And the, it hits the star, causing the reflected wave to form and the hole to be punctured on the side. Now, have we seen these explosions in no observations? Uh, well, we see it as just a very, very bright uh, dot, basically, in the sky. And so, um, yeah. So I also have another movie here, and this shows, this is just a still frame, it's <coughs> rotating in 3D, so you can see the kind of 3D system here. So the, the green particles here represent the star shell, and this is the white dwarf a little bit here in blue, and this is the reflected edge caused by the system, or by the star. So this is a comparison of my results to a professional hydrodynamic simulation. And so you can see the flat edge punctured by my simulation here and the hole caused by the star. And so this can be compared to a similarly shaped professional 3D hydrodynamic simulation. Uh, however, the main uh, shape is observed. However, uh, due to the hydrodynamic simulation, they, they get some edge, uh, the edge effect, which my simulation cannot pick up because I'm not modeling a full hydrodynamic method. However, uh, future work is to compare that and see if I can compare that as well. So for this project, I'm primarily looking at the light curves. So I'm focusing on the 2010 outburst of Euscorpi. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking the experimental data from the outburst and I'm fitting my simulation to it to see how, uh, varying program parameters to see how it affects that. And so this is a fit of my simulation to the 2010 outburst. And you're fitting the brightness? Uh, yes. Fitting. So this is, yeah, so this is magnitude here. So I'm fitting, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later on too, but I'm fitting the peak brightness, which is the energy released during explosion. And I also have a fitting parameter, which adjusts the cooling off rate here. Do interesting things happen sort of at the, you know, at, at, the, be at the beginning of, after the explosion, at the beginning of the, the, the path, to the kind of the, you know, the, the pseudo stable thing while you're between explosions. Um, yeah, so uh, this Euscorpi is a fairly kind of a, a straight kind of fall off. However, there's many different nova that give really strange bumps in the light curve. And so you can see kind of a, a bump here as well. But uh, <laughs> there's many different types of nova that give a very weird behavior here. And no one really knows what's causing that. And so this is why uh, <laughs> simulating this can kind of help explain that. And so I mean, Euscorpi is, I guess, fairly uh, a nice looking explosion. So this is my gas shell model. So this is how I'm modeling the expansion shell. So I'm using black body radiation, which is basically like taking the average temperature of the object. And so I'm treating it as an expanding gas sphere. And so it's moving outwards very rapidly. And so this represents the large peak in the light curve here. And then it, the force due to gravity basically pulls back on all the particles. And over time, it will slow down and start to contract again. And that's what causes this cooling off and this fall off on the light curve here. And so I'm using, I'm computing luminosity and the temperature of the expanding gas shell. And so this temperature, this T naught here, is used to fit my light curve, or my simulation to the light curve. And so this is basically the uh, initial temperature released at explosion. And so that was adjusted to give the peak here. And then this A parameter was adjusted to give this, uh, the rate of cooling off by the black body radiation. And so I was primarily looking at the effects of the white dwarf mass on the system. And so I varied the light cur uh, white dwarf mass here and I looked at the light curve effects over time. And so the 1.3 solar mass is the nominal case for the Euscorpi 
uh, nova. And so you can see that it cools off very fast, and that is because the exploded shell does not have as much mass as a much smaller white dwarf. And so the much smaller white dwarf has much more energy released at explosion, and there's much more mass released in the shell. And so I'll talk about this a little bit next, but you can see the, the peak of the smaller mass white dwarf is much higher than a heavier mass white dwarf. And so the shape of this can be compared to a professional model over here, and the general uh, assumptions are basically the same. So this is basically what I just talked about here. So we have comparing a small white dwarf mass versus a large white dwarf mass. And so the shell thickness here is about 428 kilometers and versus a large white dwarf mass, which has only five kilometers of shell thickness. And so this means that due to the large volume of the gas shell, more particles have to fill that region in order to reach the same density, which is one kilogram per cubic centimeter. And so the particles have to fill up and it takes much longer to explode because of the simply the large amount of volume it takes. Also, since the white dwarf is smaller, it has a weaker gravitational force, so the particles are being pulled over much slower. Whereas a large white dwarf mass, the gravitational force is much stronger, so it's pulling it over much faster, and the gas shell thickness is only about five kilometers, so there's not much mass required to reach the same density. So I looked at the white dwarf mass versus the explosion period in years, and so uh, this is 1.3 is about the nominal case for Euscorpi, so it exposed about 10 years. However, including a uh, white dwarf mass about 1.4, the explosion period uh, rapidly uh, decreases to about one year, whereas with a 0.5 solar mass white dwarf, the explosion period goes to basically about 100,000 years. And so this really illustrates the difference in the shell volumes and the gravitational force, which affects the accretion rate here. So my simulation results are here, and compared to a 1D professional simulation, and which is plotted in red here, as you can see that my much simpler model is able to capture the same uh, kind of data as a professional hydrodynamic simulation. So this is showing the different mass light curve, or white dwarf, uh, and this is plotting the temperature over the gas density here. So with one kilogram per cubic centimeter, this is when ignition occurs, and with 20 million Kelvin here. And so in this region is when the thermonuclear uh, ignition basically occurs. And so you can see uh, how different mass uh, white dwarfs will reach that uh, limit here. So the temperature on the surface is computed from this equation here, which is using the mass accretion rate, which I'm computing, and where many professional simulations take this as an input parameter here. And then the density is simply just mass over volume. And so that's computed by the number of particles that have been stuck to the shell over the volume of the shell. So parallelization was really needed for this project. And so I looked at MPI, which is message passing interface, and that allows the use of multiple cores on a CPU to share the problem in a sense. And so it's parallelized by splitting up the total particle count over the number of cores. So this is simply taking, like if you have a thousand particles and you have four cores, that's gonna be blocks of 256 shared among the processors. So this is a simple for loop here to illustrate that each processor kind of blocks up their group. And so an advantage to OpenCL, or MPI, sorry, is that you have lots of memory per core. So many desktop computers these days have like 16 gigabytes of RAM. And so the memory requirements, you're not really uh, constrained by the memory. And a, a downside is that that has to be sent and received to all the cores if the, if the other cores need uh, the variables that other cores are working on. So you have to synchronize all the cores. So I primarily looked at OpenCL too, and OpenCL is running on the GPU, which is the graphics card of a computer, and those can have about hundreds and even thousands of cores on it. And so the uh, kernel is basically a short block which is executed on each core of the graphics card simultaneously. And so it is parallelized by issuing n kernels across the GPU. So if you have a million particles, you're uh, sending off a million kernels to the GPU. And so that's where I mentioned the blocking. Uh, the problem can't fit on the GPU, so you have to block up the particles in that. So each core will calculate the force on one particle. So the advantage of this is if you have thousands of cores on your graphics card, you're updating thousands of particles simultaneously, as compared to a four-core processor where you're updating four particles at a time. So OpenCL will give me about 100 times performance boost over MPI. And so cores in OpenCL are partitioned into work groups. And so a work group can basically share local memory, which is a very fast memory space, and they can work together. And so the downside to OpenCL is that you need a very small, part, uh, very small memory per core. And so this is usually in the kilobytes. And so this is what basically limited me and my OpenCL programming and why my performance varied on the architectures was because of the memory difference. <laughs> 
And so another downside is that movie, uh, data has to be moved from the CPU to the GPU over the PCI Express lane and vice versa. And so that is much slower than just sending and receiving memory in the MPI. So I looked at some computational performance. Uh, I compared the GTX 580 and the ATI or AMD 7970. And so I found that the matrix matrix multiply, basically, this is the top bar here, gave uh, optimal performance for the card. And then I compared my simulation in red down here, and I changed the particle count to see how the number of floating point operations compare. And so a floating point operation, uh, this is in gigaflops here, so this is a billion floating point operations. And a floating point operation is any add, multiply, subtract, or divide. And so you can see for the 580, my simulation uh, with low particle counts, I'm able to saturate the GPU at a very uh, early stage, I guess. This shows that the 580, my code for the 580 uh, performs very well. And I looked at the 7970 as well. And so as you can see here, the, with low particle counts, I'm not really using as much of the, as the graphics card as the matrix multiply is up here. So it shows that my program isn't really optimized for this platform. And so I spend a lot of time doing profiling to figure out why that's the case. And so I'm basically limited by memory. And I broke up my kernel into separate kernels. And um, however, the memory latency to do that uh, slowed it down even more. So uh, the AMD was kind of, wasn't able to achieve as much performance as I would have liked on that. I also compared to Lanel's M Apache supercomputer. And so I got about half a gigaflop per core on the machine. And so that translates to about 264 cores on M Apache is needed to match one graphics card. And so for this reason, I primarily use the graphics card for my project. So in conclusion, I was able to successfully model the recurrent Nova u Scorpi. And so I was able to develop the particle recycling and blocking methods, which really helped me to do this project and which really makes my project stand out because the professional simulations are not doing this and uh, it's kind of necessary to have an accurate model of this. Uh, my simulation results compare well to professional results, such as light curves and explosion frequencies. My model is, uh, is also much simpler because the professionals are using a full hydrodynamic simulation, whereas mine is kind of uh, using hydrodynamic parts in my simulation, so it's much faster computationally, and I can simulate as many NOVA explosions in one simulation, whereas, so you're never running out of particles, basically. And so I was able to model the full life cycle of NOVA, including the accretion, which many professionals are not modeling. So a future work is to model other recurrent NOVA, such as T-Pixity, and so this is a, a very unusual NOVA as well. And then also to model other, uh, model other NOVA types, such as solar wind models. So this is where I talked about earlier, where the companion star is a red giant and the separation distance is very large. So the accretion is basically, it's not the gravity effect anymore. It's basically just um, entirely solar wind from the star. And so I just finished implementing my MLS moving least squares hydrodynamic code. And so I'm going to verify that code against professional codes such as Flash, CERN, and Zeus 3D. So I'd like to thank uh, David Kratzer and Lano for access on M Apache and my dad for buying two GTX 580 computers. <laughs> so thank you.